what happened is that Tom Bataille, uh, who was the executive producer of Evening News, uh, he worked closely together. We not only were people who worked together, but we were good friends. Both our wives uh, like France and speak French. Tom's wife better than Jean, but they both speak French. And we had planned a, a vacation of uh, about a week in France with a fishing friend of mine. I had not fished in France before, and we were on a fishing trip. And we get there, and when my fishing friend comes to pick me up uh, in the morning, early in August, uh, he said, uh, I've got the BBC on, there's something you want to listen to. And the BBC said, said that um, Saddam Hussein had uh, invaded Kuwait. Tom and I, we were moving out of the driveway, going on this long fishing and picnicking day, stopped the car, we each went in and grabbed a bag, went immediately to the airport, uh, believing this would develop into a big story. We went to London that night, did the broadcast from London with our mobile anchor concept, and headed uh, for the Middle East, hoping that we'd get into Kuwait. Once we realized we couldn't get into Kuwait, we set up headquarters in Jordan, Amman, Jordan, and we began doing the broadcast. We're talking about the whole evening news broadcast, but this time we perfected our mobile anchor thing. Using uh, Amman, Jordan as our headquarters, we did broadcasts from Saudi Arabia, we did broadcasts from Dubai, most of the Gulf states. We moved around, we were trying to get into Kuwait. Once we even chased and tried to hire some camels to ride across the desert to get into Kuwait. At any rate, we, we believed, Tom Batag and I believed, that this was destined to be a big story. Look, sometimes you miss when you follow your instincts, but everything in, in me, uh, and for that matter, Tom said, this is gonna be a big story. And I said to Tom from the first, uh, this means war. And it was sort of the dog days of summer. Our competition didn't move swiftly. Sometimes they beat us, sometimes we beat them. Sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you. But we f felt it was a big story, and we were doing the broadcast every day. And from the beginning, we said the biggest get out there, the, the most important interview is Saddam Hussein. So we worked on it. And it took a lot of work, and before the month was out, I think it was about three weeks after he invaded, less than three weeks maybe, after Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, uh, that I was in Baghdad. We'd been in, in and out of Baghdad uh, almost continually. The war was not, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and that was a fact accomplished. It was not clear that the United States was going to war, but we thought so. Some of our competitors were uh, scoffing at us, and others were leaking things in the newspapers that we were too far out on the story. We didn't think so by that time. But I was in Baghdad, I had a sore throat, knock at the door, midnight, thereabouts. Uh, Two armed men, one with an automatic weapon, uh, said in broken English, come with us. I had no idea where we were going. Uh, we'd made many requests to interview Saddam Hussein. I frankly thought we were going to the foreign ministry where we'd been before, and maybe uh, Mr. Hamdoun, who was a former ambassador in Washington, had contacted my department to see me, but I was taken immediately to the, uh, the main palace, the Baghdad Palace. When we arrived in front of it, I recognized where we were. I thought, well, maybe we're getting closer to doing an interview, but I was taken inside the palace and was quickly told we're gonna to do an you're gonna do an interview with Saddam Hussein. I said, Great. Let me get my camera crew and producer. He said, No, you, you alone, now, or it doesn't happen. And so I quickly did what I could in negotiating and the critical things for me, I had to hear it from Saddam Hussein that we would get the full interview. We would get a copy of the full interview, no games played with cutting it or anything. Um, and uh, that then having that integrity was critical to me. The man said, I can assure you that. And I said, well, I, I'd want to hear that from your president himself. I was taken down into the bowels of the palace. Uh, had a very sore throat, was neither here nor there, but I remember trying to su suppress coughs because I was kind of coughing and didn't want to do that. And I was taken down to what was his way below ground bunker and uh, was introduced to him there, and through an interpreter said, you know, I'm, I'm, I do want to do this interview, but this is important to me. He right away agreed. 
Uh, I took a deep breath and said, maybe I should get that in writing. And uh, I said, well, okay, if you agree and promise me that, okay. I went upstairs and uh, alone with their camera crew and their people uh, did a one hour plus interview uh, with Saddam Hussein. Well, the first thing is that uh, this is a, uh, a smart and cunning leader. You know, you always hope that evil or the bad person or your enemy, your opponent, will not be so smart and cunning. But he made a point of looking me in the eye the whole time. It was a bit disconcerting in a way because he's strong on eye contact and I tried to hold his eyes and it just got a little uncomfortable in that sense. Give me one, he's intelligent and he's cunning. The key to him is survival. That more than anybody you ever met in your life, this is a person who believes if he survives, he wins. And in a later interview I did with him before the start of Gulf War II, I mean, he came to believe he won Gulf War I, which is ridiculous on the face of it, except he would make the case, you know, I won because I survived. Anyway, survival is the single most important thing. Number three, I did not know this before I interviewed him. I suspected it, but I didn't know it. It became so clear. When Saddam Hussein's feet hit the ground, hit the floor every morning, he's thinking about one thing, and that is being the new Saladin, the great uh, Muslim leader of, you know, in the Middle Ages. Um, and Saddam Hussein dreams of being the new Saladin and leading a victorious Arab army through the streets of Jerusalem. That's what moves him, that's it. survival. If he survives, he wins. As we speak here, he's on trial in prison in Iraq, but he thinks he's a winner because he survived. There's no understanding Saddam Hussein without understanding that. The second is how he dreams of being seen as the new Saladin and leading that victorious Arab army through Jerusalem. And even though he's in prison, he's facing uh, trial, who knows what happened. In his mind, because he survived, there's still a chance for him to do that. Yes, the second time I interviewed him, which uh, was uh, just a few days before the start of Gulf War II, uh, he was older, but he, he has a military bearing. He's tall, over six feet. Uh, he prides himself on staying in good shape. He swims a lot. I thought he was uh, not much of any heavier than when I'd seen him before. He still had the military bearing. He's worked hard on what the military people call command presence, worked hard to develop it. Uh, it was a bit more dramatic this time in which he made a point and they made a point of bringing him down a long hallway. This was in Baghdad Palace, an incredibly long, ornate palace hallway. And you could hear his heels clicking, say clicking, hitting the, the marble, top, 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 top. And he comes, 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 comes forward. Uh, flanked by his aides and security people, his uh, large hands tattoo in the meaty part of this from his village, um, shakes hands and uh, studied him a bit. I'm sure he studied me. A little reason why he should remember me. A lot of water had gone under a lot of bridges since the first time I. But he said he remembered the other interview. I think in the between the first time I interviewed him the start of uh, Gulf War One, just before it started, uh, till the time I think there had been uh, one American television journalist who sat down with him. He didn't like the question, and I think he left very quickly after. Right. But at any rate, it was, look, it was, uh, yeah, it was a world beat. Some people would say not worth having, but in our scheme of things. But um, he looked older, grayer, I was surprised he hadn't put on more weight. I'm not sure he put on any. I could tell he'd been swimming or doing some kind of exercising. He still had the strong eye contact. I mean, I think he practices that, and I remembered it from the first time, so I got good eyes. And we, there wasn't much small talk beforehand, uh, virtually no small talk. He said, well, you know, what's this about? What do you want to do? Explain to him, we went in, and to my surprise, because he's, famous or infamous, if he doesn't like the way the interview is going or if he just doesn't like the look of the correspondent, he just get up and leave. 
one reporter, I'm told, sat down to do an interview with him. He looked at the reporter, the reporter asked one question, he got up and left. And so I, what I wanted to do was keep him in front of the camera for as long as I could. I think what we want to do is show the American people who and what he is, have him you know, say what he's going to say. He's, uh, and this time, uh, Jim Murphy, who was executive producer of the evening, was with me, but we were the only two Americans in the room. As far as I can make out, we're the only two Americans in the area code. And uh, that he, he gave it a, a lot of time, much more time than I thought he would do. At one point, he said he needed to get up and, and uh, go pray. And so I thought that's probably the end of the interview. But to my surprise, he came back after that and sat for another 40 minutes. I think we had an hour and 40 minutes sit down interview tape with him. Then to my surprise, we asked him to go to his office. Uh, and he had some questions for me after that.